Well, thanks for getting up early on a Saturday. This is an outline of what I would like to cover this morning, and I have no conflicts of interest to declare. The epidemiology is, as you see here, there are about 650,000 uh, fractures of the distal radius in the United States each year. They happen to a wide variety of patients with all manner of intercurrent illnesses, and the literature can be kind of overwhelming. The, uh, in the first half of uh, 2018, there were over 200 new scholarly articles on the topic. So these fractures range from the, uh, so what I think of as the good down here, the bad, and the ugly. The anatomy is familiar, I think, to everybody in the audience. There's 23 degrees of radial inclination. Ulnar variance averages about one millimeter negative ulnar variance, a volar tilt of 11 degrees. And the goal of treatment is to restore the anatomy if you can, uh, more importantly, to restore function and to avoid late problems of instability, arthrosis, and pain. What do we do with a non-displaced or minimally displaced distal radius fracture? If it's a stable pattern, you can treat, in a low demand patient, you can treat that in a cast or a splint. You should check the EPL function when the patient presents uh, because uh, it's common, uh, it's not uncommon to have a rupture of the extensor pollicis longus uh, in a non displaced fracture. And vitamin C is sometimes recommended for distal radius fractures to avoid um, problems with uh, RSD or complex regional pain syndrome. And the AAOS guidelines on this go back and forth. Um, this patient uh, also happened to have a, um, a fracture of the triquetrum that you can see here, just dorsal to the carpus. Okay, Rich, um, uh, has, um, Rich Schenk has mentioned many times in conference that stability is... Um, a little bit difficult to define, but this, uh, the stability of distal radius fractures was investigated in a classic article by LaFontaine in 1989, and there are five factors that um, were considered, and if you had three or more of them, then the fractures tended to collapse if they were treated in plaster. Um, this patient was younger than 60, didn't have an well, had an associated ulnar styloid fracture and didn't really have much dorsal comminution. It was an intraarticular fracture, but he was treated successfully with just, uh, just a cast. To answer the question whether fracture is unstable, Rich has pointed out many times that there's a stability of, uh, there's a spectrum of stability. And I want to also point out that cast treatment requires a cooperative patient and requires vigilance. This is a patient who broke his wrist while at summer camp and doesn't look too displaced, doesn't look too angulated, little dorsal comminution. But by the time he got home from summer camp, he had this impending malunion, which brings me to the next point, which is that there is pretty good evidence that you should address impending malunions. Early Jupiter studied this way back in 1994 and found that early uh, correction of an impending, or he called it a nascent malunion, did better than the ones that were treated late. So uh, volar plating, which I'll talk about in a few minutes, has become very popular, but don't throw away the dorsal plates. They worked well to salvage this case where I was able to put a dorsal plate on with a piece of uh, uh, iliac crest and salvaged a good result. The next question that logically comes up is, is a reduction acceptable? And the article that gets quoted and often misquoted is a study from Nurk and Jupiter way back in 1986 that greater than two millimeter articular step off was bad. And this was purely a radiographic study and didn't uh, look at any type of functional outcome. And not much has changed in the 25 years since that classic article. And the study by and McQueen in 2011 showed, again, that a two millimeter gap and step off, or step off was bad. You should try to get them less than two millimeters short. And as you can see in the lower x-ray, you try to get the carpus aligned so that the capitate and lunate are lined up with the distal radius. So you want to try to end up with good carpal alignment. It's nice to try to aim for less than two millimeters of step off, 
But if you have a severely comminuted fracture like the one you see on the top where part of the articular surface is sitting in the subcutaneous tissues by the ulnar head, you can try to reassemble that um, uh, as well as you possibly can. And even if you got it back to two millimeters or less, it's probably not going to give a favorable outcome. The central problem is what I like to think of as the styrofoam cup problem. When the fracture gets smooshed down, like you see on the lower left here, um, even if you try to prop it back up, it never goes back exactly to the same shape as the coffee cup was before it um, got smushed. Before I talk about the ways that you can try to prevent the coffee cup from recollapsing, I want to touch on a couple of special considerations. The first is the open distal radius fracture, and it turns out that these behave more like open fractures in the hand than like an open tibia fracture. And at one stage, uh, irrigation and debridement in ORIF is now largely considered acceptable, except in cases of severe comminution. Complications in open distal radius fractures seem more related to the amount of contamination. So for those of you uh, who have never seen an external fixator on the distal radius, this is how we used to treat a lot of closed distal radius fractures. So not every open distal radius fracture needs to be X-fixed with a, a second washout and late ORIF. The other special consideration I want to touch on is the ipsilateral scaphoid fracture. These are not rare, and they usually happen in high-energy injury uh, situations. They're uncommon in the elderly probably because osteoporosis leads, the fracture, uh, leads, leads to a fracture of the radius and protects the scaphoid. But this is the hand surgeon's equivalent of the femoral shaft fracture with the femoral neck fracture. You have to make sure you don't miss uh, the more problematic fracture when you're dealing with the obvious one. And the treatment for this is usually to fix both fractures. Uh, screw fixation lets you, is, is strong enough to allow for early motion in the uh, distal radius so you don't get a, a stiff wrist um, by being afraid to move the, uh, the wrist with a scaphoid fracture. Lately I've taken to putting staples across the uh, scaphoid fracture in the setting of distal radius fracture. It, less, it requires less dissection. It's just as strong, and I haven't seen the scaphoids go on to, um, to non-union when they were fixed with a staple, even when the wrist was moved early. You can fix these scaphoids through a dorsal approach as well, but then you're adding a volar approach, and a dorsal approach tends to lead to more stiffness. Volar plating has become very popular. And um, some people would consider it to be the gold standard. It was initially popularized by Orbe back in 2002. He only published on 29 patients, but things seem to have taken off. And it works very well for simple fracture patterns with uh, good bone. But uh, the old saying in orthopedics is when you have a new hammer, everything starts to look like a nail. And we probably have gone past the point of inflated expectations and come through the trough of disillusionment for this. We're probably pretty far out on the curve, but there are some situations where this, uh, this type of approach won't work, and I'd like to touch on those. So there are two important questions to ask your patient preoperatively if you're thinking about using a volar plate. Did you ever break your wrist before? Because if you have a deformity of the distal radius from an old fracture, it's likely that the standard volar distal radius plates won't fit properly. The other question is, does your hand ever go numb or wake you from sleep? Because if people have pre-existing carpal tunnel syndrome and you don't address that even if they're not symptomatic, you may be in a situation where you're taking the patient back to the operating room when they come in at two-week visit with their hand swollen like this and their fingers going numb. So better if you can take care of both problems at the same time. The next question that you have to ask yourself is, is the fracture reducible? And you need to be aware of the intact volar cortex. So if you have a distal radius fracture uh, of the Barton's uh, variety and it's a dorsal fracture, it may be hard to plate these from a volar approach. You can do it. You can put the screws through intact volar cortex and try to capture the dorsal piece, but it's difficult. So don't throw, again, don't throw away the dorsal plates. They come in handy for this fracture. Next uh, question is, is the fracture uh, reducible in the coronal plane? It's good to be able to reduce it on the lateral projection, but you have to make sure that the fracture is reduced in the coronal plane if you want the plate to fit properly. And you also have to make sure you put the plate uh, 
in good location because if you don't, then, uh, and it sticks off the radial side of the distal radius, they'll have irritation postoperatively. That can be hard to do through a small incision like you see here. What if you have opened this fracture up from a volar approach and then you find you can't get it back where you want it? There is the orbe maneuver where you pronate the shaft of the radius in this slide. You can see the, it's a volar um, image of the left distal radius. You can actually grab the radial shaft with a, um, with a, a bone clamp and spin it out of the way. You can then tuck the articular fragments back where they belong and try to uh, supinate the fragment again. It's a little intimidating to take apart what you might not want to put back together. Um, and I don't do this in every case. Usually I'll only do this if, uh, if people present late and, I can, and I'm convinced a volar approach is needed. Incidentally, the timing of open reduction and internal fixation doesn't seem to matter as long as you get the reduction um, appropriate. And that's been substantiated on a couple of recent um, papers. So you're fine waiting a week or 10 days for the swelling to come down in these patients. It's not wrong to operate on them the next day. But if, uh, if you want to wait, that's also okay. So next question that comes up is how long should the locking screws be? And this has been investigated in a recently published paper. It turns out that about 75% of the width of the distal portion of the radius is sufficient if you have good bone and particularly if you have an extra articular fracture. Uh, the... Uh, important thing to remember is that the screws may appear very short but as you can see on this CT scan, they can be hidden by Lister's tubercle when you look on x-rays. And dorsal penetration of the cortex risks um, irritating the extensor tendons on the back of the wrist and can lead to extensor tendon rupture. They can also, with longer screws, uh, penetrate the distal radio ulnar joint. Uh, one other point is that if you get true to size x-rays, um, the anterior to posterior dimension of the lunate bone will approximate the appropriate length of a screw uh, through the distal portion of the plate. The next question that arises, is the bone quality good enough for early motion? You want to avoid doing what's called an oif, an open internal fixation with these. You want to make sure the screws are not in the joint when you leave the operating room. They can be very close if the distal articular fragments are small. And if the bone is not captured well, and if the bone is soft, the distal screws can go through the, the articular fragments almost like a, a cheese cutter and can end up in the joint like you see here. So you have to watch carefully for early collapse. As far as the screw lengths goes, it would have been nice to capture those dorsal fragments, but then you risk extensor tendon irritation, and you might have to go back and take the plate out early. So you're kind of damned if you do and damned if you don't sometimes. What about removal of hardware? Soon uh, classified the location of the plate into zero, one, and two grades, depending on where the um, distal part of the plate falls relative to a line, parallel to a line drawn along the volar aspect of the distal radius. Probably the soon twos that you see on the far right should come out, and the reason for taking them out is if you don't, you risk rupturing the flexor pollicis longus tendon, the incidence is not high, but I have seen it as late as five years after open reduction internal fixation. So just because you get through to a healed fracture doesn't mean that the FPL won't rupture. And it's kind of a big job to repair that uh, with tendon transfers or a graft. Well, we're on the subject of removing hardware. It's a good idea to remember that the median nerve is very close to the... Um, plane of the dissection in fixation from a volar approach. This is one case that was done out of the country and then came to my office with pretty bad median nerve symptoms. So I took this patient to the operating room, did a carpal tunnel release. The plate wasn't in good position. And so you can see my plan for a longer uh, incision to replate the radius. And when I got in there, the median nerve was sitting right um, next to the flexor carpi radialis tendon, and there was a couple of stitches through it, one through the main body of the nerve that you see in the bottom left, and then the other, there is the palmar cutaneous branch in the median nerve, which is it's a real structure, and if you bag that, this, they also put a stitch through 
that branch of the nerve, they can have numbness and hypersensitivity in the palm. So better to avoid these problems, especially if you're going back uh, uh, to take out hardware. The uh, subject of ligamentous or soft tissue injuries and distal radius fracture has, fractures has received a lot of attention recently. It turns out that if you look at people with intraarticular fractures, there's a pretty high incidence of ligamentous injury, and that may account for some of the people that don't do well after open reduction and internal fixations it can be as high as 50% in some studies. Early ligamentous problems include the TFCC problems are not, strictly speaking, a ligament, although it does connect two bones together. And um, I want to remind people that the uh, ulnar-sided wrist pain is probably the last pain to go away in distal radius fractures, and persistent pain may warrant uh, arthroscopy. This patient had ORIF distal radius. Looks like a very good job. Fracture healed in good alignment, all, met all the radiographic criteria, but still had ulnar-sided pain. Here are a fist compression views on the bottom right. You can see that she does not seem to be very ulnar positive. The one screw on the ulnar side of the distal radius might be a little close to the distal radio ulnar joint. And so I got a CT scan, which you see on your left. The screw was really close to the distal radio ulnar joint, but didn't penetrate it, so I didn't feel like the plate had to come out. And on the bottom right, you can see uh, the triangular fibrocartilage complex. You're looking basically from the dorsal view toward the ulno, uh, into the ulnocarpal joint, and it should not look like frayed tissue. This is uh, on the top right is what a normal TFCC looks like. You can see the probe there, and you see what the uh, shape of the TFCC is on the left. You can remove the torn tissue and by a month afterwards um, have a happy patient. So. That's the arthroscopic approach to that problem. Late ligamentous problems, um, I'm seeing more and more in my office. This patient had a distal radius fractured uh, 25 years ago and probably at the same time tore his scaphalunate ligament, and that's why he went on to this pattern of radioscaphoid arthritis, slack wrist, but now he's got a malunion of the distal radius and a slack wrist, and that problem can be solved elegantly with um, a proximal row carpectomy, you see the proximal row of bones has, uh, row of carpal bones has been removed and use those bones to plate the, uh, to, uh, to graft the osteotomy of the distal radius. Again, don't throw away the dorsal plates. Now the question um, becomes what's going to happen to these people who have scaphalunate uh, interosseous ligament injuries? You see the gap in this uh, patient's right wrist on the PA view. There's a slight gap between the uh, scaphoid and the lunate, and um, plating of distal radius was done, good result, carpus is well aligned, but is this patient headed for problems in 20 years? And I think the answer is we don't know for sure. Another problem with the volar plating of the distal radius is collapse of the lunate facet. The coffee cup gets crumpled, and even though you put it back where it belonged and tried to put some screws underneath the lunate facet of the radius, you can see in the top left that the fracture's gone on to collapse again. And here's a different case, again, where the lunate facet has collapsed, and you can see there are screws in the joint, and the lunate is sitting right on the tips of the screws. One of the reasons that this happens is that in this type of fracture that you see on the lower left, the radial styloid usually has a reasonably sized piece, and you can capture it with screws, but there's sometimes, as you can see in the lower left, there's just a wafer of bone, and it's very difficult to fix that without putting the screws into the distal radio ulnar joint. So these can be treated with radiolunate arthrodesis. On the top left, I did that with a staple and uh, got rid of the patient's pain. There is also plate fixation for radiolunate arthrodesis that you see here on uh, your right. In that case, I did it with a shortening of the ulna. This was for an arthritic case, and if you look closely, you can see I also took out the distal portion of the scaphoid, which was arthritic. So a few different ways to solve the problem of lunate facet collapse. Um, so is volar plating the gold standard? Well, I'll present this case of bilateral distal radius fractures neurovascularly intact patient fell on both hands and so she was treated this is the uh, this is the right side and the left side was on the last slide treated with ORIF bilaterally here are her uh, early post-op x-rays thought I did a pretty good job got the carpus aligned got her out to length pretty smooth reconstruction of the articular surface uh, 
And on the right side, I even put some extended, uh, put a plate with some extensions on it to try to capture the lunate facet of the radius. Left uh, the OR feeling pretty good about that. Here it is in close up. You can see the extensions on the plate. And then at six weeks, here she is with the scaphoid and the lunate sitting right on the, those extensions. And it doesn't look good on the x-rays and it really doesn't look good on the CAT scan that you see on your lower right. So in orthopedic surgery, you're uh, told to expect the unexpected and have a plan like this guy who got hit by a car after he had his femur nailed. So the um, plan was um, uh, to address the, in, the uh, reported lunate facet uh, escape. Sometimes that lunate facet fragment is so small there's no way to fix it stably. And this has received uh, attention recently in uh, two papers. So. We don't have complications in hand surgery. We have staged procedures. So stage two procedure was back to the operating room, take out the plate, try to reduce the volar fragment again, and put on this bridge plate and pin the carpus back where it belongs. Stage three was go back and take out the hardware. And uh, she looked good in the operating room under fluoro, but I was a little nervous when I first saw her at her post-op visit. And it turned out that the reduction held, and here are some late post-op x-rays, bilateral distal radius fractures. Right wrist is not moving quite as well as the left as you would expect, but good pronation and supination. So uh, the um, latest thinking about osteoporotic uh, bone in, uh, in distal radius fractures, maybe we should be bridge plating a lot of these. Hanel and his coworkers in um, Seattle published recently on bridge plating of distal radius fractured in people who use assistive devices. The goal is not to prevent late arthrosis. It is to allow early independent function. So bad distal radius fracture, bridge plating with the plan to go back and take out the plate. Nobody's sure exactly when. And it allows early independent function here. This patient up and about with her walker. She's got good motion in her fingers and she returned to independent function even with the plate still in. So late result, fairly smooth articular surface, and radiographically she looks pretty good, and clinically also not bad. Two operations, but no collapse. All right, so I thought, well, maybe this is the new standard for selected patient. Here's a bad distal radius fracture that I got called about recently, and it was a provisional reduction. You can see that's not likely to do well, doesn't meet the radiographic uh, parameters that are associated with good, good result. So I thought, okay, good, take her to the operating room, put a bridge plate on, and that should solve the problem. Except that she called me at about six weeks after surgery and said, you know, I have some more wrist pain and I'm having trouble moving my fingers. So come back to the office, bridge plate broken through one of the holes in the plate. And so, okay, you need to have that taken out. Fortunately, the fracture is healed, but she managed to shred many of the extensor tendons, not all of them. So kind of stressful situation in the operating room, what to do with that. And so here she is with the uh, extensor tendon transfers to try to allow her to open the hand again. We've probably gone past the peak of inflated expectations for the bridge plate. Maybe this was the trough of disillusionment. And uh, late radiographic findings, carpus well aligned, pretty smooth articular surface. She's got a little scapholunate diastasis there, but gap between the scaphoid and the lunate. So far, she's not complaining about that. And reasonable result, pretty good pronation and supination of the forearm. Hand opens and closes pretty well with... Um, uh, the tendon transfers. I want to say a few things about distal radio ulnar joint problems. These are better avoided than fixed later. On the top left is uh, x-ray doesn't project very well, but you can see it looks kind of funny, pretty good PA of the wrist. And um, but there's a little overlap between the radius and the lunate. And this uh, radio, distal radio ulnar joint was completely dislocated, and that's a tough problem to try to treat late. On the right side, you can see more subtle distal radio only joint malalignment. And Chris talked before about the Galeazzi fracture. When these fractures extend far up the radius, uh, 
they can behave like a Galeazzi fracture, and that was the case here. And he mentioned pinning of the uh, distal radio ulna joint. This is an example of open reduction of the distal radio ulna joint with repair of the TFCC over the suture, over the uh, endo button that you see there. And you can see in the bottom right the distal radio ulna joint is lined up properly. So this can be done early, even before the fracture is healed, and was able to salvage a fairly good result there. When the distal radio ulna joint problems present late, like in this malunion, uh, they um, probably are not suitable for, uh, for uh, open reduction of the distal radio ulna joint. Here's me trying to do the trigonometry to figure out how big a graft I'm going to need for uh, realigning the distal radius in this patient. She was an elderly woman but, um, uh, and was treated in a cast initially. She kept her own house and she came to me and said, you know, can you do anything? My wrist is killing me. The, uh, the person who took care of her initially didn't want to operate on her. She was on Coumadin and thought she might do okay with just a closed reduction in casting. And some people will do okay with this x-ray, but she didn't. So it's kind of a big job. As Chris said, you have to be prepared to work sometimes. So this is an example of a distal radius osteotomy, iliac crest bone graft, and a distal ulna replacement. And um, uh, I saw her recently for a separate problem. She's nine years out, still very pleased. You can see about the amount of bone resorption around the implant. Uh, from the stress shielding, but she continues to keep her own house and has a functional uh, left upper extremity. And here she is in late follow-up. So what are the take-home messages? Restore anatomy, avoid distal radial and joint problems, watch for uh, intraarticular ligamentous problems, follow distal radius fractures closely no matter how you treat them. Early motion is desirable, but probably not critical. And there is salvage for the failed open reduction internal fixation, and we should remember to choose our complications wisely. By now, you've probably got the idea that this is kind of a, uh, an area that's kind of a swamp, treatment of distal radius fractures. Um, but I hope what I've had to tell you will help you avoid some of the alligators that are out there. Thanks uh, a lot for your attention. <laughs>